So in 451, the Catholic Church declared that Jesus Christ is true God and true man and taught that he is one person subsisting in two natures. Now this is based on reading the New Testament and what the teaching is about Christ in the four Gospels and the letters of Paul and the other apostolic letters. And the, the formulation is that Jesus is an eternal person, the eternal Son of God, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the eternal person of the Son of God subsists as both God and man. So he's truly God and possesses the divine nature, and he's truly human by virtue of the incarnation in the womb of Mary, has a human body and a human soul, and so he possesses a human nature. He has all that is human in him, and he is also all that is divine as one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now when Aquinas goes to analyze this mystery and to think about the, the union of God and man in Christ, he takes the traditional line of thinking of the Catholic Church and talks about what's called the hypostatic union. Hypostasis in Greek is a word that means subsistent person or concrete subsistent entity, like it, you or I are a hypostasis because, not just because we have a body or a soul, or because we have a human nature, but because we're one unique personal human nature, we're one person, one concrete uh, thing. Okay, so when you talk about the hypostatic union, you're talking about the fact that Christ is a personal hypostasis. He's one concrete person as God and man. And the union of the two natures, the union of the humanity and the divinity, occur in the person. Um, they occur without a fusion of the two natures. So God becoming human does not mean that the humanity of Jesus becomes his divinity or his divinity becomes his humanity, that there's a sort of union in such a way that there's a confusion of divinity and humanity. What it means is that the second person of the Trinity, who is eternally God, begins to exist as human, as man, and expresses his identity as the eternal Son of God, his personal identity as Son, in and through his human actions as man. So what Jesus does in his human nature is expressive of his divine identity and person without a confusion existing or a fusion existing between what is human and what is divine. Well, that's a very profound mystery. I mean, you look at it concretely in the Gospels. Jesus can raise the dead because he's God, but he does so some, by touching people or by speaking to people as man. He wills humanly divine effects. Now, when, Christ, when Aquinas talks about Christ being both God and man, he says we need to figure out, first of all, is the union of the divinity and the humanity a substantial unity or an accidental unity? Uh, these are Aristotelian terms. When we talk about like an accidental unity, you're talking about something like, mm, how is the car seat united with uh, the car, the rest of the car? Well, accidentally, because it's kind of a relationship. It's screwed on there, but you could unbolt it. You could take the car seat out. Or how are you and I united to, I don't know, a place that we're at uh, concretely right now, but by a relationship. We can get up and we can change places. So there, if there was a kind of accidental, uh, if a political unity is often an accidental unity. People agree on a certain course of action. They have a sort of unity of mind and heart. Uh, a, a, you might call it a moral unity of will. But they don't really have a substantial unity because the, the people cooperating are substantially distinct realities. A substantial unity is like the unity of your body and soul. The soul and body are one in being. So you can't, uh, as it were, separate your body and soul uh, like you separate the car seat from the car and still be okay because uh, your substance depends on being both body and soul together. So Aquinas says the first thing we need to say is that the hypostatic union of God being man, of the Son of God being true God and true man, is a substantial unity, not an accidental unity. Christ is one concrete reality. He's one subsistent person, one thing, who is the Son of God, who is truly God and truly man. So when you touch the hand of Christ, the man, you touch the physical human hand of God. When Jesus Christ um, walks on the shore of Galilee, it's the Lord, the, the eternal Lord, who is the Son of God, walking in a human way through his human will and human actions um, uh, through an, in and through human bodily activity. Okay, So concretely, he is the Son of God. If he suffers, if Jesus suffers and dies through uh, the excruciating suffering of the crucifixion, it's the Lord God who dies 
in his human nature, experiencing the separation of his human body and soul through human death. So that's very mysterious. And then Aquinas says, now here are two errors to avoid. On the one hand, we don't want to say that he's a, it's a substantial union between the two natures in the one person because there's a confusion of the natures. So you wouldn't want to say this, for example, because God has become human, God is no longer in his nature eternally divine. God is now a human being uh, in his very nature. Like God has ceased to be God, he's become human in his nature. There's no longer a divine nature. Now there's just a human nature or some new fusion of human and divine natures. Well, that's crazy. God is always God and God doesn't cease being God by becoming human. You also wouldn't want to say that because God became human, Jesus' human nature is not the same as ours. Like, he's not a human being in his nature. He's some other thing because he's united with God. So there's a third kind of nature there that's not divine or human, but some third thing. Okay, so we don't want to say that. So in Christ, there's a real distinction of the human nature and the divine nature, even though he is one subsistent being. Well, that's unlike any other human being, because in every other concrete human being, you have one nature, human nature, rational animal. Jesus is a rational animal and a human being like us. He has our human nature, but he's also God and he has the divine nature. So that's part of the mystery. You, you want to say this one subsistent person who is the son of God, but he's truly God and truly human without confusion of the natures. And on the other hand, you don't want to say that the union of those two natures is merely accidental, to go back to my simple analogy to the car seat, as if the human nature and the divine nature were somehow really two things. That would be a theory like Jesus is two persons. You know, there's the man Jesus, and that's one person, and then there's the eternal Son of God, and that's another person. And these are sort of very close to each other, but they're not really united. So then you'd have, um, you know, the man Jesus, who would be really holy. Uh, he's like Francis of Assisi or Mother Teresa, but like on the scale a little further, because he's particularly close to the Word of God or the Son of God. And then the Son of God is an eternal divine person, really close to the man Jesus. No. The man Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of God is the man Jesus. When you look at Jesus, you're looking at the eternal Son of God who is man. When you touch the hand of Christ, you touch the hand, the physical human hand of God, because Jesus is God. Okay, so we don't want to say there are uh, a confusion of natures, and we don't want to say there's a distinction of persons. We want to say there's one person subsisting in two natures, and that is the substantial union in him of, of divinity and humanity in the one person of the Son of God. Now that's just a little introduction. You actually can spend your life thinking about this mystery. It's coherent. It's not contradictory. It's not contrary to reason. It's not demonstrably provable that it's real by natural reason because it can only be known about by faith and through reading the New Testament and understanding the teaching of the apostles. But it also cannot be demonstrated to be false by some kind of philosophical objection. God can become human because God's omnipotent, and the way in which God has become human in Christ is totally coherent and mysterious. So it's both intelligible and numinous, and those are not contradictory. It's mysterious and it can be studied, and that's what we do in theology, and Aquinas has a beautiful and profound analysis of the hypostatic union, which you can study in the Summa Theologiae.